All right. Well, um, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come. I, uh, in some ways, uh, am an unlikely person, I guess, uh, to be uh, presenting at uh, a committee uh, investigating 38 Studios since uh, I've only been in office for a year and uh, was not around when uh, all of that was taking place. Uh, but this is now my second uh, uh, oversight hearing. I did one in the Senate side about a month ago. And while I can't speak to uh, how the 38 Studios deal came about and who said what to who and, and so on, what I can do is present some ideas for what the state should do going forward uh, to help uh, us avoid some of these pitfalls in the future and to do things better uh, uh, going forward. So uh, that's what I hope to do today. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the subject of tax credits. Uh, now, as you all may recall, uh, there was a uh, tax credit deal that was uh, uh, in the works, so to speak, uh, to support 38 Studios. Uh, it was not actually completed. The credit was never actually awarded. Uh, but a number of questions have come to light uh, in regards to that tax credit uh, transaction. And I think it's led to a number of questions from the public and others uh, about for example, uh, who are all these people who were involved? Why were they involved? Why do you need to have a broker of a tax credit? Why do you need to have private investors? Uh, is that necessary? Is it really the best use of the public's money? Uh, do you need to have brokers and investors and these other third parties in order for a tax credit program to work? And uh, our conclusion in Treasury, after studying this for the last month or so, uh, is no, you don't need to have brokers or private investors for a tax credit program to work. And in fact, uh, that may not be the best type of tax credit program, one where you have all of these other third parties uh, getting a public benefit. Um, there may be, and we feel that there are, much more efficient ways to operate a tax credit program where you can still have the same benefits supporting economic development, construction, jobs, film productions, et cetera, uh, but to do it more cheaply, more cost-effectively, uh, and eliminating uh, some of these middlemen and some of these third parties, uh, some of whom uh, uh, have gotten some attention uh, uh, from this committee and, and others uh, looking into the 38 Studios situation. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. How do you take a tax credit program and make it as efficient and cost-effective as possible? Just for a summary, Rhode Island currently has four tradable tax credit programs. The historic tax credit, which promotes the rehabilitation of historic buildings. This is our oldest tax credit program. We've had it in one form or another since 2001. It's awarded by the Historic Preservation uh, and Heritage Commission, administered by the Division of Taxation. Uh, the second oldest is the Film Production Tax Credit, which has existed in its current form since 2005 and promotes not only films, but also other artistic productions, television productions, theater, et cetera. Uh, this one's administered by the Rhode Island Film and TV Office, uh, and this was the one uh, that was potentially at play uh, in 38 Studios. And then there are two new tax credit programs, tradable tax credit programs, that were enacted by the General Assembly last year in 2015. One of them is the Rebuild Rhode Island Tax Credit, uh, this is designed to promote construction uh, projects of special economic significance to the state, not just historic structures, though it can be historic structures, but really any type of construction project uh, with uh, significant economic importance. Uh, no credits have been awarded yet through this program, uh, but it is being administered by the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation, uh, who expects to start issuing credits under uh, this program soon. Uh, and then the other new one that was enacted last year is the Qualified Job Incentives Tax Credit. Uh, the idea here is to encourage companies uh, to hire here in Rhode Island who would otherwise be hiring in other states. Uh, the first credit, as you may have read, was just awarded this week by Commerce Rhode Island to a company uh, in Lincoln called Greystone. I'll go a little bit more in depth into these later in the presentation. What is a tax credit program? Why would you have one? Uh, tax credits allow governments to uh, fund and promote projects of public policy importance. Uh, but the uh, key point to understand here is that uh, under a tax credit program, the state has no uh, 
cost has no uh, financial liability unless the project has been successfully completed. So in some ways, it would be much simpler if you gave a developer or a film producer a bunch of money up front to, uh, to uh, facilitate their production. Uh, but then you run the risk of the project failing. You run the risk of you know, the developer skipping town with the money. Uh, with a tax credit, the state is not actually on the hook until after the project is complete. That's why uh, the 38 Studios tax credit deal never reached completion because the project was ultimately uh, not successful. The federal government has been uh, providing tradable tax credits uh, for about a generation now. Uh, the largest program, I believe, is for historic rehabilitation. And dozens of other states also offer tradable tax credits. Uh, the way it works in its simplest form uh, is represented in the chart at the bottom of the slide where the state uh, awards a tax credit to a developer, whether it's a building developer or a film producer or the like. After the project is completed, the developer uh, then can deduct the value of the credit from their tax liability. This is the simplest way that a tax credit program can work, uh, and it does uh, often work in exactly this way. But it can be much more complicated than this. For example, what happens if the developer needs cash up front to facilitate the project. Um, you know, under this model, if the developer needs money before the project to actually fund the building expenses or the film expenses, this alone doesn't help them. So this is where the lender gets involved. After the developer is awarded a tax credit, the developer can go to a lender, whether it's a bank or any other lender, take out a loan, uh, use the uh, 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 the uh, loan proceeds to complete the project. After the project is completed, uh, the developer takes the benefit of the credit out of their taxes uh, and then pays the lender back. Sometimes it works this way, but again, oftentimes it's actually more complicated because what happens if the developer, after the project is complete, still doesn't have enough income to pay the lender back? What if the developer doesn't have enough taxable income to claim the full value of the tax credit? This is where the uh, private investors and sometimes the brokers get involved. Now, this is a very complicated chart, but this is often the way that tax credit programs work. And so I'll walk you through it step by step. Before you do, can I just ask if there's any questions? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so under this uh, scenario, and this is a very common one, and this is the one that I think most closely mirrors uh, what was uh, planned with the uh, 38 Studios uh, deal, uh, the state uh, awards the tax credit to the developer. The developer then connects with private investors that pay a lot of taxes, uh, either directly or through a broker. And there's an agreement made that the developer will sell the tax credit to the broker and to these private investors. But the key point here is the sale doesn't actually happen yet. It's just an agreement to make the sale to the broker and the investors after the project is complete. It's an agreement to make a sale. It's not actually a sale yet. So the uh, developer agrees to sell the tax credit to the broker and the private investors then goes and takes out the bank loan to fund the project. Project is funded, the project is completed. After the project is completed, the sale occurs. The developer sells the tax credit to the private investors, uh, possibly through a broker, uses the cash proceeds from that sale to pay back the lender. And then the private investors who have purchased the tax credit use that credit to offset their tax liability. Another point to note here is that uh, oftentimes the sale of the tax credit to an investor is a taxable event at the federal level. So the broker uh, may have to pay federal income taxes on the proceeds from the sale of the tax credit. Now there can be ways to get around this. Um, there are uh, uh, examples of complex transactions that have been uh, uh, successfully performed that allow the developer to avoid the federal tax liability, but more often than not, uh, uh, there is that tax liability. So... Before you go oh, yeah. on to just slide six, um, and we had had a discussion, 
looking at, because we're looking at 38 studios, and then looking at this wonderful chart that you've put together, that isn't the sequence that happened with the tax credits with 38 studios. In fact, the state had not awarded them. And the important thing in this is the SCC is investigating this. And uh, basically what we've been able to show is they, um, they had brokers, they went to lenders, but we hadn't assigned the tax credits yet. So they just assumed they were going to get it and bypassed that and went on to the other steps that you've talked about. So, thank you. So there's pros and cons to this model. On the positive, again, there's no expense to the state unless the project is completed. That's a pro. Uh, the developer gets the cash that they need up front to help fund their project, their building or their uh, film or what have you. Uh, and the developer uh, can use the proceeds of the tax credit sale uh, to repay the lender. Uh, so it doesn't matter if the developer doesn't owe a lot of taxes uh, after the project is complete. Uh, the developer is still able to uh, use the sale of the tax credit to somebody who does owe a lot of taxes, uh, use those proceeds to pay back uh, the lender. On the downside, there's a whole lot of players involved here, and everyone's getting paid in one way or another. So it's not necessarily, uh, under this model, the most efficient way uh, to fund a project. Uh, it's also worth noting that, okay, of these different parties that are involved, um, the lender is taking on some risk. If the lender, uh, if the project fails, then the lender who made the loan to the developer uh, will lose their investment, so they're getting compensated for risk. The brokers and the private investors, because they're not actually purchasing the tax credit until after the project is complete, uh, they're not necessarily taking on a whole lot of risk. They're being compensated. Uh, despite taking on much risk in this scenario. Uh, and that can be the sign of an inefficient market. It's one thing if people are getting paid for taking on risk, but if they're uh, getting paid for a riskless or close to riskless investment, uh, that's the sign that the market may not be operating as efficiently, the system may not be operating as efficiently as it could be. And just to illustrate, and I, I will uh, emphasize that this is uh, these numbers are not exact and they're not universal, but this is a uh, representative example of where the benefit of a tax credit program may go. And this is based on our offices over the last few weeks had a number of conversations with developers, attorneys, others who are, uh, have been involved on the tax credit scene in Rhode Island for a number of years uh, to give us a rough idea of uh, you know, how these deals generally go. And you know, under this uh, scenario, uh, you know, you can assume that the broker and the investors are buying the credit for around 85 cents on the dollar. That tends to be, uh, at least for the historic tax credit, uh, the numbers that uh, we've been hearing recently. Uh, the lender, let's say, is getting about 5% of the benefit. They're getting paid for the risk that they're taking on for their loan. If uh, the tax credit is being sold to a broker or an investor, uh, it can be a federally taxable event uh, for the developer. Uh, and what this means under this scenario, and again, this is just a representative example, uh, only about 55% uh, of uh, the dollar that the state is spending on the tax credit program is actually going to the project that you're trying to help, is actually going to that building or to that film. Um, in other words, in plain English, under this scenario, uh, to support a $5.5 million project, uh, the cost of the state would be about $10 million. Just a representative example to kind of paint a picture of what uh, this can look like um, uh, uh, without any controls in place. Let me just give another caveat too, which is uh, say there was no uh, sale, say that the developer had the income to just use the credit against their own taxes, then this would look very different. Then there would be no investors, no broker, and also no federal tax liability if the developer was able to just uh, use the credit themselves without having to trade it. So this is just a representative example of what it would look like in a situation where the developer did have to sell the credit to a uh, private investor. Before you go on to the next slide, though, um, uh, Vice Chair Chippendale has a question. Mr. Treasurer, thank you very much for uh, providing us with the uh, simple and easy to understand stuff because uh, guys like me need, need all the pictures we can get on this. Uh, so I'm looking at the percentages here. and. Uh, are, are, it's representative linear as a linear uh, breakdown uh, mm -hmm. with the total 
net proceeds being about 55 percent, as you indicated. Um, are every one of those uh, percentages are they are they all uh, is it all cumulative or, or is it uh, is a broker say making five uh, percent of the entirety or five percent of the net proceeds is it ever mixed up that way yeah I'll just say um, these deals are by no means standard sure. so they can happen in all kinds of different ways and the actual price that a broker or a private investor would charge can be calculated in all it's kinds of different ways. It's negotiated when they're... It's negotiated, okay. and it may be a percent of the project expenses. It may be a percent of the full credit. I mean, there's no standard way of doing it. And actually, you raise an important point, which I was going to get to later, uh, which is that uh, up until now, there's been no public reporting of the prices or the terms of uh, tax credit transactions, which is one of the recommendations that I'm going to be making at the end, that there should be some more transparency around that. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so what I just showed you is an example of how a tax credit program might look if there were no controls in place to make it efficient. There are ways to make tax credit programs more efficient so that the state gets more bang for its buck, so that that $5.5 million of actual project costs could cost the state less than $10 million to support. There are ways uh, of making tax credit programs more efficient. And uh, some of these methods have already been adopted in one form or another in some of the state's programs. So there's a few different ways that you can, you know, in layman's terms, make the system cheaper for the taxpayer by eliminating some of the need for these middlemen or these third parties. Uh, one way is to make tax credits refundable, which I'll explain in a minute. And that's already been adopted in some of Rhode Island's tax credit programs. Another way that I've been asked about a lot is, well, instead of having a private person out there who's acting as the broker between the buyer and the seller of the tax credits, could the state just create some sort of a website or an exchange to connect the buyers and sellers? Uh, you could do that. Uh, or um, uh, a perhaps less efficient but still uh, viable version would be to keep the same system, the original system, but through better reporting and better transparency, try to make the market for tax credits a little more efficient. So let me walk through each of these three options. It's sort of a menu of options that you could choose from, uh, some of which have already been adopted. So option one, making tax credits refundable. Uh, what this basically entails is saying that uh, if the developer needs to sell a tax credit because the developer doesn't have enough of a tax liability to claim it against their own taxes, well, instead of selling it to a broker or a private investor, sell it back to the state. Uh, under this model, just following the chart, state uh, 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 awards the credit to the developer. Uh, the developer takes out the loan, completes the project. Uh, then the developer sells the credit back to the state for cash. It's kind of like instead of awarding a tax credit, you could be awarding you know, a grant, but only after the project has been completed. Uh, then uh, the developer takes the proceeds from that and uh, uses the proceeds from that sale to the state to repay the lender. The benefit here is that there is no need for private investors or brokers. Uh, the state doesn't need to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, charging any more for this than uh, the most efficient price. Uh, the developer uh, doesn't matter whether they have a large tax liability at the end of the project or not. They're still able to get the benefit of, uh, of a sale. And uh, there are some downsides, though. Um, you know, the state uh, would be paying in cash rather than paying through tax forgiveness. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's more expensive. In fact, I think that in most cases it would be cheaper for the state to do, but it does uh, create some additional challenges uh, for budgeting uh, and so would maybe, you know, uh, produce some extra gray hairs from the, uh, the folks in the budget office or the fiscal office who have to plan for these things. Um, and also, you know, there is... Um, in kind of a roundabout way, having tradable tax credits and looking at what the purchase and sale prices for those credits are can give you some interesting data to look at to see, you know, is the state issuing larger credits than it needs to? Uh, if, you know, the state's issuing a credit at a million dollars and then it's being sold to a private broker at, you know, 40 cents on the dollar, that could be a sign that maybe the state was awarding a larger credit than it needed to. So, there is some interesting data that could be found by keeping the system uh, tradable. Um, 
but it's not necessarily the most cost-effective way. So under this example, a refund uh, example, it would look more like this. Uh, you still have the lender. There's still a bit, you know, a project financing uh, loan that's taking place. Uh, it would still be a federally taxable event when the uh, developer sold the credit back to the state. But that's it. And uh, under this model, if you, again, simplifying, but if you assume, you know, the cut of the bank is still the same and the cut of the federal tax uh, liability is still the same, uh, far more of the benefit uh, is going to the actual project which would mean that you would uh, not need such a large tax credit to support a project of a given size. That same $5.5 million of project expenses that cost $10 million in the last example uh, would potentially only cost the state uh, less than $8 million under this example because uh, you're essentially eliminating these parties that are uh, uh, being compensated uh, without the refundability. Um, Taking it a step further, uh, there's a line of thought that says, okay, you allow the developer the option of selling the credit back to the state. Maybe the state could save even more money by buying back the credit for less than 100 cents on the dollar. Uh, maybe if the state bought it back at 99 or 98 or 95 cents on the dollar, uh, then uh, you could make it even more efficient uh, because the state uh, would be spending less than they would if they bought it back at uh, 100 cents on the dollar. That is true, but it's true only if there isn't a private broker or investor who's willing to come in and pay more. So if you had a refundable tax credit uh, that could be refunded to the state at 90 cents on the dollar, uh, that would save the state another 10% on the value of the credit. But if somebody else was willing to come in and buy it at 91 cents on the dollar, then the state wouldn't save anything extra. So you're kind of, uh, you know, you're... Uh, uh, taking a risk there, a risk of maybe trying to be a little too cute if you have that floor being too low. Uh, but certainly it is possible that by refunding at less than 100 cents on the dollar, you could save the state some additional money. Option two, and this is the one that uh, I get asked about the most. Um, rather than having this private broker who's getting paid to connect a developer with an investor, why not just have the state be the broker? Why not have the state set up a website or some kind of exchange with a list of all the people who are selling tax credits, a list of all those who are buying, uh, to connect the buyers and the sellers? The pros of this model are that it eliminates the need for a private broker, uh, and you know it also may reduce the margin uh, that the private investors would be paying too because by having a more transparent market of who the buyers and sellers are, uh, the developer would have a little more uh, leverage uh, to get a be the best deal available and maybe sell that credit for 98 cents on the dollar instead of 93. Um, the cons are, you know, because that private investor is still involved, it's still not as efficient a system as option one. Uh, it's still not, uh, in theory, going to save you as much as just going the refund route. But it is better, certainly, than doing nothing. Uh, and, of course, you know, as, as uh, we all in government know, um, operating a website can sometimes be a little more complicated than it looks. And uh, while it's certainly viable, there would be some cost and some challenge to operating that sort of an exchange uh, effectively. So, again, just a representative example of what this might look like. Um, under this scenario, uh, there is no private broker. Uh, the exchange, the state-run exchange, could maybe charge a small fee to cover our operating expenses, but it wouldn't need to be as large as what the private brokers tend to make. The investors in this example, and again, this is all speculative, but the investors would maybe uh, be getting a 5% cut instead of 10% because it's a more efficient market with more transparency. Um, you would still have the bank loan. Uh, the sale uh, to the private investors could still be a federally taxable event. Um, but under this model, that $5.5 million project that you're trying to support uh, would cost less than the $10 million in the absence of, uh, of an online exchange. Before you go on, we have a question. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you again, Mr. Treasurer. Um, as you've so clearly illustrated, uh, and in, in, in my line of work, it's the same thing. You know, the more hands touch something, the more people are being paid, and that, that certainly takes away from what ultimately the people we want to, to get these uh, um, 
these resources will will, will get um, with with this this model here, which I can I can see where where the uh, the, the net is is a little bit less. Um, are, are we, you, you know, as, as, uh, as a state, is your office able to say, okay, we, we've got this pool that we can define of what we're going to make available mm-hmm. as, uh, as credits in whatever form they happen to take? Uh, and then with that fixed cost, which we should presumably be able to at least get a ballpark of plus or minus 10% uh, relative to the website, the administration thereof, staffing or anything like that, um, and then amortize that across all of the, the credits. Would we be able to, with, with a relative degree of certainty, say, okay, here are our fixed costs and, yeah. and then administer the program that way and it, sort of eliminating the, another hand that it yeah. goes through, therefore eliminating another chunk? Um, I mean, I get that it's not as efficient as, as the refund, but uh, would that? It would be an improvement still, yeah. And, um, you know, I think that we could certainly try to estimate what the cost of operating a, a system like this would be. I think the, um, you know, the variable is uh, how much in tradable credits are out there. We know how much are out there today. We don't know how much will be awarded in the future. And okay. so that's, that's a big that variable. That would be a moving target every year? Yeah, okay. to some extent. I mean, there, I'm, I'm going to get to this in, later in the presentation. There are some controls Sorry in for place. Sorry for jumping ahead. No, okay. the there, there are some controls in place um, for some of the programs around how much can be issued. But um, that would be the variable. You know, I, I'll, I'll also say another um, – aspect to the online exchange idea is, uh, you know, I asked the question to to my team when we were preparing this, you know, why hasn't the private sector stepped in and offered this solution already? You would think there's an opportunity to be had here, and it does turn out uh, we found one company out of California that's uh, in the process of trying to launch a website to facilitate the exchange of tradable tax credits. They're kind of a startup. They're new. I don't know how much of a track record they have, but we have been in contact with them. And I imagine if we did go down this route, uh, we or the state would, uh, you know, put out an RFP and solicit bids and, and so on. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Maybe I should have started with this um, because I know I had some misunderstanding. Maybe we could go in before you continue, just a little bit of background of what your office, where it... Yeah. We... um. The Treasury has historically not had any involvement in tax credit programs. Um, As I laid out at the beginning, uh, some of the programs have been administered by the Commerce Department or the old EDC, uh, some by by other offices. The Division of Taxation is ultimately tasked with tracking who are the holders of tax credits and then, of course, making sure that when they are uh, redeemed that those folks are paid. Treasury has not had any involvement in the past. Uh, We uh, were asked to uh, come and present on this topic and are happy to do so. And I think that we are well suited to do so because we are a financial office, even though we uh, haven't dealt with tax credits in the past. And I think we're able to offer some impartial opinions because, uh, you know, we don't have skin in the game one way or another. Uh, We're able to be, I think, um, uh, uh, impartial and balanced in both our analysis and in the recommendations that I'm going to offer shortly. Thank you. I think we have one, another question. Yes, Representative. Yes, thank you. I'm finding all of this very interesting, but did uh, 38 studios or that uh, uh, 38 studios mess, for lack of better words, take advantage of any tax credits? Not that I'm aware of. No, they were trying, but it's looking at the whole procedures of the tax credits and what we can put into place, because we do have lenders in the state that did lend money and did take a loss. So this isn't directly involved with the 38 studios per se? Um, Some of it is looking at the history of it and what they were trying to do, and then tax credits in general and where we can move to make sure that um, we don't have that happen again where they're believing they're getting tax credits and they're going to our lenders. And so. I think it's accurate to say that um, although the tax credit deal in 38 Studios was not completed, uh, you know, it did bring the issue to light and the topic to light that maybe our tax credit programs can be run more effectively. There are certain, you know, high-profile parties and individuals who stood – to make a lot of money if the tax credit deal had gone through. And I think, you know, it's legitimate and important for us to be asking, is that really necessary? And uh, I'm I'm arguing that it's not. I guess the other question I had was, what criteria must someone meet to become a broker? I'm not sure that there is any. 
Uh, I don't think that it's a, uh, a regulated profession. I, I could be wrong about that, and Paul might know better than I do, but I, I don't believe there is a, a license or anything like that. Oh, anyone could call themselves a broker and, according to some of these figures, could make obviously hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. Yeah, someone else might correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm not aware of any requirements to be a broker. Was, was 38 Studios far enough along in the game of, of uh, receiving tax credits or, or vying for tax credits where they had a broker involved in the situation? And if so, who was that? I only know what I've read in the media and in the depositions, but uh, my understanding is that there was an individual uh, uh, who was attempting to be a broker or who was acting as a broker, representing himself as a broker. Uh, that would be uh, uh, Mr. Corso. Mr. Corso. Uh, who I, uh, but I, again, I, this was before my time, so I only know what I've, I've read in the, the Mine media. as well. Yeah. We can get you the documentation on that, of what he was doing I, and how much. Yeah, I him kind of assumed that that's who it was, but. Yeah. Thank you. If you want to continue, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, so the third option that I'll present, if you didn't want to go the refundability route and you didn't want to go the online exchange route, you could stick with just the traditional model that I laid out at the beginning, but require uh, that every time a tax credit sale or transaction was made, that the price uh, of the, uh, uh, the transfer uh, be reported, say, to the Division of Taxation and be posted online. And this would at least lead to a more efficient market where developers would have a better idea what a fair price uh, to settle for for their credit would be. And I don't want to belabor this one too much, but again, under this version, all the players uh, from the original version are still there, but maybe the uh, broker and the investors are, are making a little less because uh, the developer has more information about what a, uh, a fair price for his cre or, or her credit would be. So as I mentioned earlier, some of these controls, some of these uh, options for reform have already been implemented to some extent in our existing tax credit programs, and I do think it's important to run through those uh, briefly. With the original historic tax credit, uh, this was established in 2001. Uh, when it was originally established, these controls were not in place. There was also no limit on the amount of tax credits invested, and there wasn't any test to make sure that those who were uh, receiving the historic tax credits, developers, building owners, actually needed them. Uh, originally, anybody who was doing a, an eligible project to their building would get a credit, uh, regardless of whether they needed it or not. Then after a while, I think we moved to a, a raffle-based system. Um, but there wasn't a, a needs test. Uh, because there wasn't uh, any limit or test on it, there was a huge number of historic tax credits issued in the early 2000s. At one point, I believe there were more than $300 million of uh, historic tax credits floating around waiting to be used or claimed. Uh, at that point, uh, the General Assembly chose to freeze the program in 2008, still honor the credits that had already been issued, but not issue any new ones. Uh, there was, I gather, um, some anxiety that with more than $300 million of credits outstanding, uh, it would be a real hit to the state if a large percentage of those were all claimed in one year. And so uh, the decision was made back then to issue a bond uh, to help smooth out the costs of the credits that had been issued under this program and provide some budget flexibility. It, of course, succeeded in providing that budget flexibility, but uh, uh, predictability, but the downside is that's another layer of cost, uh, paying the debt service on the bond. In 2013, the historic tax credit program was changed again, and the credits were made 100% uh, refundable uh, to nonprofits that were holders of the tax credit. So a nonprofit uh, developer, for example, uh, you know, an AS220 or a, a school uh, that was awarded a historic tax credit could sell it back to the state um, uh, for 100 cents on the dollar. And a private developer uh, who was uh, a holder of a tax credit could sell it to a nonprofit at, say, 97, 98 cents, and then the nonprofit would then go and redeem it for 100. Uh, and that uh, is now becoming fairly common. Uh, we estimate, and Paul knows these numbers better than I do, that uh, about $140 million of those old historic tax credits uh, approved before 2008 uh, are still outstanding today. The film production tax credit, uh, there's a cap on how much can be uh, issued each year. 
Uh, up until this uh, year, the cap has been 15 million annually with uh, 5 million per project. Uh, the film production tax credit is not refundable, although um, it is uh, generally more efficient than the historic tax credit program. And when I say efficient, I mean more cost effective with, with less leakage to third parties. The reason is that while it may take a year or two to restore a large building, uh, your average movie or, or play is, is only in production for a few months, so the cost of the loan is uh, much cheaper. Uh, and also um, uh, uh, the um, uh, amount of time you know, that uh, uh, goes by elapses before the sale. So uh, what we hear anecdotally, and it's all anecdote because there is no standardized reporting of these things, is that generally the film tax credits, when they are sold, sell for around 90 cents on the dollar, as opposed to the historic tax credits, which are, you know, trading uh, uh, before the 100 percent refundability, we're trading at you know 80, 85 cents. Um, so the film tax credit is is more uh, efficient because of the shorter time frame that's involved. The two new tax credit programs uh, that were approved last year, Rebuild Rhode Island and the Qualified Job Incentives have a number of new controls uh, that are new to Rhode Island uh, that uh, will stand to make these programs more efficient. Perhaps the most important one is that unlike the old historic tax credit program uh, back in the early 2000s, there is a needs test uh, for both rebuild and for the qualified jobs incentive tax credit. So uh, if you are a developer who wants to rehab or build uh, a structure, and use the Rebuild Rhode Island tax credit, you have to demonstrate to the Commerce Department that your project would not be economically feasible unless you received the credit. This is new, and this is, I think, a very important development. Uh, you have to share your financials, your pro formas, et cetera, to the Commerce Department, demonstrate that you actually need the tax credit in order for your project to occur. There's a cap of $15 million per project, and there is a refundability of the Rebuild Rhode Island tax credit, uh, although uh, the refund is at 90 cents on the dollar, which, again, uh, makes for a more efficient system. It may set sort of a floor on the price of tax credits, and it could save the state some extra money, but um, only if some, somebody else isn't willing to come along and buy it for 91%. Um, another important new feature, which I'm going to talk about in a second, is that uh, for rebuild and also for the new jobs tax credit, the tax credit can't be claimed all in one year. It has to be claimed gradually over five years. So I'm a developer. I finish my project. I'm ready to either redeem my tax credit for 90 cents on the dollar or apply it against my tax liability. Uh, I can't do it all in one year. I have to do it over a five-year period. Um, and I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of that in a second because I actually think this is a, an important point. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so with the, uh, the criteria that, that need to be established, as you pointed out, in order to, to, uh, um, to establish that, it, it, it's obligatory to have these, otherwise the project cannot proceed. Um, using the old, uh, the, the, you know, making a, your resume fit a, every particular job and making it different, as an example, uh, would these pro formas, would these uh, business plans and these other documents that are part of the, the application process, would these be uh, existing documents that they've already submitted, whether it was to um, uh, Commerce or to anyone else, would they be existing, uh, you know, tax documents, or, or would there be a separate process where they might be able to uh, enhance it, and in, in if, if you don't understand where I'm, where I'm going, uh, to try to make it more favorable uh, towards them getting the, mm. the, the credits, or are we dealing yeah. with strictly, hey, these are the documents? Yeah. So You'll have to ask the Commerce Office okay. what their rules, regulations, procedures will okay. be. Um, uh, okay. Um, yeah. Very, thank you. One of the things that we had talked about together is even if they met all of the criteria and submitted everything, it's still up to the Commerce Corporation to okay. decide whether they get it or not. And that's something that we will be following up with because that certainly then lends itself to who will get it and who won't. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, uh, the policy objective is to only award it to those that actually would need it and to award it to those uh, projects that would have the greatest economic impact uh, for the state, but the exact ins and outs of how that's determined is something that uh, 
uh, uh, the Commerce Office would be more well suited to answer than, than me. The Qualified Job Incentive Tax Credit uh, has all those same new controls as Rebuild. Uh, the uh, employer has to demonstrate that it would be cheaper for them to hire somebody in a different state unless they receive the tax credit. So again, there's that needs test that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, exists in Rebuild. That same 90% 90 uh, 90 refundability is there in the Qualified Jobs Incentive Tax Credit. Although I think it's also worth noting here that because these are by and large going to be awarded to employers of some size in Rhode Island, it's more likely that they are going to be uh, taxpaying employers that are just going to uh, use the tax credit to offset their own taxes and not try to trade it or refund it. Uh, that's you know, may not be the outcome in every case, but it's much more likely to be the outcome here than for a, uh, uh, a building development uh, or a film. Uh, and then there's also that same five-year smooth requirement as in uh, Rebuild Rhode Island. And I, this is my final uh, slide before I get to the recommendations. I do think it's worth thinking about uh, this five-year amortization or this five-year smooth uh, requirement that's new to both Rebuild Rhode Island and the Qualified Jobs Credit because there are pros and cons to it. Uh, on the pro side, certainly it provides more budget flexibility. You're not going to run the risk of being hit by a full redemption or a full claim against a, a tax liability all in one year. Um, it also could give you the opportunity to put some more accountability into place. So. Now, you know, not only are you making sure that the project is complete, but you could make sure that the, the building is still full or that the uh, uh, employee is still employed up to five years after uh, uh, the credit is awarded. So uh, it gives the opportunity for that greater accountability as well. Uh, but there is a downside, and the downside is that by stretching out the length of time during which the benefit of the credit can be claimed, you are stretching out the length of the loan that was used to finance the project and leading to higher expense. Um, we have no way of knowing uh, right now how much greater this expense to the lender will be, this uh, expense to the um, uh, uh, servicing the bridge loan. Uh, but, you know, as a representative example, it is at least conceivably possible that uh, adding another five years onto the loan will make the loan so expensive that the credit becomes inefficient again and, and less efficient than uh, it would have been uh, uh, without any controls in place. Uh, so again, just a representative example, because there haven't been any Rebuild Rhode Island credits issued yet with this provision, it's really hard to know uh, exactly what the extra cost of the loan will be but it's very likely that there will be at least some extra cost to the loan because of the longer duration. So given that, uh, we at Treasury have three recommendations. Uh, our recommendations are geared around making tax credits as efficient as possible. What is the cheapest way for the state to support a project of a given expense? Uh, our recommendation is that we move to 100% refundability uh, of all tax credits, uh, not just the historic. Uh, we feel that this is the most efficient way, the way to make sure that, again, by eliminating these unnecessary parties who are part of the deal, uh, you can support projects uh, in the most efficient way for the taxpayer, for the state. Uh, to the extent uh, that you still do have some tax credits out there that are being traded between private parties, we recommend that the transfer and sale prices uh, be reported to the Division of Taxation and posted online so there's at least some transparency around what the uh, market price for the credits is. Uh, and then third, we do think that we should revisit this five-year smoothing requirement, consider whether it makes sense to shorten it, to eliminate it. Uh, also consider that if the goal, the primary goal of the five-year smooth is to provide budget flexibility year to year, there may be other ways to do that. Uh, one way would be just through more conservative budgeting, assume that every year a large amount of the tax credit is going to be uh, claimed. Uh, that way, if you're wrong, you're more likely to have a good surprise than a bad surprise. Um, 
Or uh, you may not want to go down the road of issuing a bond like was done back in uh, 2008. But if there was a year where uh, more in tax credits was claimed than was anticipated, the state could take out a short-term loan, a two-year loan or a three-year loan, to uh, uh, spread that expense uh, over a short period of time, uh, which would provide for some smoothing. Um, there's no easy answers here because there are trade-offs on the five-year smooth. There are pros and cons to having it, pros and cons to shortening it or eliminating it. But we do think that it's worth some consideration uh, what actually makes sense. In conclusion, I do want to emphasize that when it comes to having a tax credit program that is efficient for the taxpayers, we've already come a long way. There are a whole lot of controls in place now that were not in place in the past. Um, we now have 90 percent refundability for rebuild and for the jobs tax credit, 100 percent refundability in some cases for the historic tax credit. Uh, we have the test of uh, need in order to be awarded tax credits under rebuild and, and uh, the jobs uh, program. Uh, so there are a number of uh, improvements that have already been made, and I do think it is worth noting that. Uh, that being said, uh, the 38 Studios tax credit deal, even though it didn't arrive uh, at completion, uh, has brought this issue to light and has uh, brought us to a place where we are, I think, appropriately asking the question, can tax credits be administered in a way that is even more efficient for the state, for the taxpayer, that achieves the same policy goals of promoting construction, promoting economic development, uh, but does it in a way that is cheaper and thriftier for the taxpayer. Uh, it's asked the question, do we need these brokers and private investors in order for a tax credit system to be successful? And uh, the answer is no, you don't. Um, there are ways to make tax credit systems, uh, uh, programs even more effective. We've presented with you uh, tonight, we presented you with a number of options for how you could make our tax credit system more efficient. Uh, we've recommended uh, our favorite uh, uh, options, which are full refundability, transparency, and uh, revisiting the five-year smooth. But there are other options, uh, like the online platform, that you could explore. Um, I think that there are absolutely uh, ways that we can make the system more efficient ways that we can make it better. Um, one of the silver linings of this uh, terrible 38 studio situation is that it has given us an opportunity to examine these issues and discuss them. Uh, so I thank you, uh, uh, the committee, and uh, especially the chair for your leadership on this, for giving us this opportunity. And uh, happy to take any other questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Vice Chair Trivendale. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer, and, th and especially thank you for uh, providing us with a, a presentation that is, uh, quite frankly, probably one of the easiest to understand, uh, especially dealing with such a um, complicated process. I, it, it means a lot uh, for us as, as a committee to understand this. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. I, I agree wholeheartedly that uh, we have come a long way from a process that was just so uh, available to all sorts of malfeasance. Um, just one particular question, and it's 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 mostly born out of my uh, curiosity because bonds are are pretty much uh, in in every discussion uh, that that seems to be going on today. Um, in the five-year smoothing that, that you spoke about, and I certainly understand how and why that that needs to be done. Uh, is it always done through bonding? No, no. So um, so right now, there's no borrowing that's taking place. All that's happening now under rebuild and under the jobs tax credit is. Whoever holds the tax credit can't use it all in one year. They can only use it gradually over five years. It forces that smooth, basically. Yeah, exactly. And so it provides the benefit of the budget predictability. But the downside is that, you know, that loan that the developer took out from the bank to fund the project is now going to be longer and more expensive. Sure, for them. Yeah. And in the instance... Well, for them, but, but, but the state is subsidizing state, that. Yeah. Right. So in the instance where we did bond it, was it a revenue bond? Oh, this was in 2008, and um, I don't believe it was a revenue bond, but that was before okay. my time. Just, I don't know. Again, curiosity, I, yeah. because we're dealing with it. I'm trying to educate myself as much as I can. All right. Uh, uh, again, thank you very much. I, I really uh, appreciate the, uh, the simplicity that you've given us this very complicated issue. I think we have some more questions. 
Yes, thank you very much. This was really helpful. Uh, what jumps out at me, and I, I go back to pages two and three where you outlined the tax credit programs and that each of the four you told us who they were administered by. And so what jumps out at me is that there were such different terms for each one. Um, I know it's before your time, but can you, can, can, you, can you suggest why they'd be so different? And do you think it would be best if we went to one model so that we didn't have all these different types? Or is it industry dependent? What's your opinion on that? Well, we are recommending, Treasury is recommending refundability for all of them. Um, I think that if you decided to go in a different direction, like the online exchange, uh, that could also be implemented for all of them. Um, but there are some, you know, idiosyncrasies. Obviously, producing a movie is very different from building a building. So I think, uh, you know, in the details of how you approve projects and how they're monitored and held accountable, you know, there are going to be differences kind of in the administration from from one program to another. But, no, our, our uh, recommendations that I've laid out here tonight uh, could apply to all four. Questions? I just noticed, and I've been through the PowerPoint um, a couple times, but on page 17 um, where you're talking about the historic tax credits, and we have an estimated $140 million still outstanding. That's quite a significant amount um, that I'm sure does cause gray hair downstairs. I, they've already been issued. Is there anything that we can put into place? I mean, some of these could date back to 2001, so they could be technically almost 14, 15 years old, um, to put into place so we don't have this mass. Uh, well, the, the bond that was issued in 2008 should solve that problem. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I want to thank you for volunteering to come here. We know it wasn't part of your department, and it took a lot of research, and it's really going to benefit where we move forward. Well, thank you, Chair. Thank and, you. and if you indulge me for just one second, I, I always make a point of thanking my staff. Um, those of us who are in elected office are in front of the cameras, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes, and in particular uh, our policy team, Kelly Rogers, Tom Segoros, Jeff Padua, uh, B. Lanzi, Sharon Rose, David Ortiz, uh, were very helpful to me in putting this together. So thank you to everyone. Great job to 